Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail, Holy Queen. So the importance of these questions is for us to recognize our need for God's grace, but also what is required for our cooperation with the grace of God. The grace of God is there, it works, but there are natural gifts also God gave to us which work hand in hand with supernatural grace. Because God can't give me the gift of faith if I, I, I don't have the gift of reason. The natural gift of reason. It, it, it can't work. Faith enlightens reason. God cannot give his goodness to me if I can't receive him through the natural gift of the human will he gave to me. Okay, so grace and nature are not contradictory. They work hand in hand. Because nature, as we said, nature is God's gift and the grace is God's gift. But the gift of grace elevates nature to the level where nature cannot reach by itself. Okay, so basically that's what we are looking at here. And also to realize that realistically we can't do anything for salvation if it is not the, that special intervention gift of God. If we would, God would become incarnate. We wouldn't have been the incarnation. If there is a way, we would have saved ourselves. But there is no way. And also, of course, we need salvation today probably more than ever because of, uh, you know, people before us sinned, okay? They committed the same sins we do. But today, with us means of you know, what we call technology, there is facilities, like if you do good, okay, there is easier facilitation for that good to spread. So also, if you do evil today, it can spread with a lot of ease, okay, through so many different means. I mean, it's just amazing. Can you imagine, I think you know, you already know this. This um, so-called website where they tell many people to cheat. You, you, you heard about that. It's a website created, I think the man who heads it lives here in Vegas. I saw him some time back in. So, it's like life is too short to have an affair. That is their brand. Okay? Life is too short to have an affair. Okay? So, these are just you know, stupid people. Okay? <laughs> life is short, so do evil. <laughs> Can you imagine that? That's what they're saying. But what is so scary is this, you know, that their website was hacked thanks to those hackers. You know, if I knew them, I would give them a big hug. <laughs> so, so they hacked the website, okay? And it's, it was said that now the whatever, private information of 37 million people who are their customers. And just imagine that. 
Life is too short, you're married, have an affair. Okay? This is for married people who want to have affairs. That's the website they go to. 37 million people who use that website. 37 million. So that's what's going on. You would think that if such website would even die out and wouldn't have customers. But 37 million. Last year they made a net profit. I think yeah, that, that's what they said. 112 million dollars. So the hackers now hacked their website. They are threatening to basically give out all the information and everything about everyone who used it. I, I, I pray that they do. <laughs> okay? I really pray that these hackers are not merciful. Okay? That they go ahead and do this. So if someone said that now 37 million men, I don't know the big body, some women are running scared. Women. They were supposed to first say like fighting for women, but now they're more men and women. So it is scary. Sad. There were a cartoon in the in the newspaper the other day, you know, the man who is white was sitting on the sofa, and men are saying, I hope she doesn't find out that we're cheating. The wife is saying the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so that's why that's why we need God. Okay? And and what is so scary is this, okay? That okay, people people can do that, okay? Whatever people do those things. But to have even a public place where they are told they can go. And basically, this is like a normal. No, no, nobody cares. So we ask ourselves, what is abnormal now? Because everything seems to be okay. So that's why we need the grace of God to help us. Okay, so since grace is required for every salutary act, okay, there is nothing we can do for salvation to place any one salutary act without the help of God's grace. Okay? So no one can even begin the process of faith, conversion, and salvation without the help of God's grace. So the question is this, can one acting on one's own without the help of grace take the first step in the process of conversion? For example, by seeking, praying, repenting, asking forgiveness in response to which God bestows his grace. Or does God always take the initiative by inspiring and moving the human creature to do these things? So if the human creature cannot take the first step toward God without the help of grace, why is this so? Why cannot it or we do nothing in the order of salvation without God's prevenient Rest. Because that is true, there is nothing we can do. But why? Mm -hmm. Remember, whenever we talk about salvation, we say that you need a savior. Salvation from what? How from sin and the power of the grip of the devil. Okay, from sin. So, why can't we save ourselves from sin? Strong enough. Mm -hmm. Our will is not strong enough without some assistance. Why can't we save ourselves from our sins? Sin gives us the answer. Okay? Ephesians chapter 6. Beginning with verse 10. St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 10. Let's look at verse 10. It says, then, of course, Jesus says, you know, so this, 
so many things concerning this. Chapter 6, beginning with verse 10. In the battle against the evil. Finally, draw your strength from the Lord, the His mighty power. That's the only thing that can save us from God. So, put on the armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the tactics of the devil. For our struggle, this is why we can't save ourselves. Okay? For our struggle is not with flesh and the blood, but with principalities, with the powers, with the world rulers of this present darkness, with the evil spirits in the heavens. We are not fighting another human being. Okay? We are fighting the devil. And because the devil is a spiritual being, and we are flesh and blood, there is no way we can win a spiritual battle. Okay? In order to win the spiritual battle, because the devil is using spiritual weapons, so we also need spiritual weapons. Okay? So he's using spiritual weapons of evil, we need spiritual weapons of good. So that's why we need the armor of God. That's why we saw last week, we looked at this text, we need truth, okay? faith, the word of God, and so on and so forth. That's the reason we can't redeem ourselves from our sins. We're not fighting another human being. You cannot invent weapons to fight the devil. However powerful your weapons are, you know, the devil doesn't care. Because we cannot unleash any kind of violence, we can beat the devil's violence. It's impossible. So that's why we need God. So opinions. As we saw earlier, that the seven Pelagians of the 5th century held that the human creature can take the initiative in the process of conversion. Remember what the seven Pelagians said. Their solution was that okay, Pelagius said we don't need rest, we only need free will. Augustine said we don't, there's nothing we can do to save ourselves, we need the grace of God completely. So the seven Pelagians said, no, Pelagius is extremist and Augustine is an extremist. So let's find that middle point whereby you know, the two extremes can converge. And so their solution was that yes, we need grace for salvation, but the initial process of salvation must be a free act where the will is not influenced by grace. So they said that we need that point, and once that point is reached, the person makes a decision, and that point, we call, we call it that emissium fide, okay? the beginning of salvation. And the Simulations were saying that that is a free choice we make without the help of God's grace. But then we said that they created a false problem and their solution was also basically a false solution because there is no such a thing as a moment in the process of salvation where the human will doesn't need grace. Okay? So that was uh, the semi Pelagians. So they thought that this was required, that uh, basically a free decision without the influence of grace, in order to make man, not God, ultimately responsible for the fact that once one person comes to faith, another does not. One person is saved, another is not. So they said, if you say that it's God's grace, okay, then the person wouldn't be responsible for their choices. But St. Augustine basically had answered that earlier when he simply said okay, that true freedom is when the free, rather free will is liberated okay, from darkness, from sin, and then we truly act freely. So for the same Pelagians, and of course Pelagius as well, they thought that if you introduce, if you, you inject grace in the process of all, at least in the, at the beginning of the process, then a human being is not blameworthy. They all praise worthy for what they do because it is God's grace, not them. So they misunderstood what really true freedom is. Okay, biblical teaching. 
No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him or draws him. So the human creature cannot take the initiative coming to Christ because it's only when God draws the person by the attraction of grace that one will feel any effective desire to turn to Christ in a true faith. So and this and similar biblical texts, some of which we saw above, show that it is not the human creature but God who takes the initiative in calling humans to faith, good desires, and good works. Okay, now, one can say, okay, if it's God's initiative, why do some people don't have faith? It's still a choice to accept the grace we take. Mm -hmm. We have the freedom either to accept or to reject the gift. It doesn't mean that well, God you know, gave some the gift of faith and he didn't give it to others. The gifts of God are like you know, the air we breathe in. Okay, if you live in our atmosphere here, you may refuse to breathe in air, but that doesn't mean that air is not available. Okay, I may choose not to breathe it in and die, but it is available. So by way of analogy, the grace of God is available to each and every human being He has created. But we must accept it. God doesn't force us or compel us to believe in Him. So that is basically the essential failure. But of course, of all humans, you know, we have these misunderstandings. But the essential failure of Islam, okay, to, you know, to spread the sword, rather the faith by the sword. You can't convert from our faith to, to another who will kill you. Okay, God doesn't work that way. God doesn't need me to kill people for him. He can wipe out the entire human race instantly if that's what he wants. He doesn't need me to help him. Okay, what he needs me for as an instrument is to do what he asks of me to do. God, you call that, you know, God uses instruments, instrumentality. So that's why we must know God in order to be effective instruments. Because if we don't know God, we may think that we're doing God's work, when in actual fact, it is our own wills and wants. The Peter, who had seen Jesus do all these things, also misunderstood Jesus. So remember when Jesus, who was with them and saw the, saw the miracles, the teachings and everything, when Jesus said, I'm going to suffer and die, the Son of Man will suffer at the hands of sinners and die. What did Peter say? Oh, no, no. no, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Because he lacked knowledge of God's ways. So what did Jesus tell him? Get behind me, Satan. You think as humans do, not as God thinks. That's why it's very important to learn the faith, to be formed into it, so that we no longer see from our point of view, our human point of view, which always leads us astray, but now we can see from God's point of view. Of course, after the resurrection, um, the Father sent the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit enlightened them, now they were able to more effectively see from God's point of view. So that is very significant for each and every one of us. Because if we don't know God, we keep doing things, thinking that we're doing God's work. But what we do has nothing to do with God's work. We're doing our own thing. We do, we do what we want, not what God wants. Okay. So if I don't know God, okay, I may basically cover what I do with God. Okay. I put God's name on the wrapping, but inside it's not God, it's me. So we need to do the things that help us to know God, prayerful study, okay, worthy reception of the sacraments, prayer, and so on and so forth. Okay. All that helps us to deepen our knowledge of God. Because as I always say, you know, they are, 
within even like uh, we usually talk about you know, other people like Muslims and whatever but we don't really need Muslims to be mean to each other okay we are <laughs> Catholics can be so mean okay, to one another within the same environment why because we're not of one mind and one heart why because we don't know Christ each one, you see this in our groups, church groups, everywhere. Okay. Every Catholic church you go to, you have these groups, they don't get along. It's like a constant battle between different church groups. Each group wanting to dominate the other, okay. to do whatever, the gossip, the whatever. It's, it's not only among you know, people, among priests, gossip, whatever. So that's what Pope Francis uh, basically talked about when he was addressing the Curia last Christmas. Okay. He told them you are gossips. Because you are in love with yourself more than you are in love with God. Okay. So, so because you don't know God. So it's very important to know, to know God. Very, very important. Because often times we may think that we are following God when in actual fact we are following ourselves, we must have one else. Okay? So, that's about kind of biblical teaching, knowledge of God. Teaching of the Magisterium, the Indicrus, I told you about that document, around 440 AD. God so works in the hearts of men and in the free will itself that a holy thought, a good counsel, and every movement of a good will comes from God, because it is through Him that we can do any good, without whom we can do nothing. Okay? The, this is indicative of what we said. We are not talking about any good, meaning that greet your neighbor. We are talking about any good in the order of salvation. Yeah, because if the pagans, you know, greet their friends and so on and so forth, it's a good act, but it's not salvific. Okay? So you can't say that I will go to heaven. Why? Because I greet my neighbors. Even pagans do the same. I'll go to heaven. Why? Because I love my children. Even pagans do the same. I will go, I hope to go to heaven because I love my enemies. Then that's talking again. Now you, again. now you are talking as a Christian. Yeah. I will go to, I hope to go to heaven because I bear wrongs patiently. Now you are talking as a Christian. Yeah. I will go to heaven because I love those who love me. No. <laughs> No. <laughs> there was a man you know, who was a drunk at home in our village, in our village. He was a drunk, but he used to go around saying, you know, I hate people who hate me. You know? <laughs> I hate people who hate me. Yeah. That's sad. That's natural. He was the same man who we used to go around saying that was bearing a, a very heavy cross. Do you know what his cross was? Drinking. Yeah. Drinking. Because he wouldn't walk straight. <laughs> so he was bearing a very great cross. Okay, those things, you know, the natural things that they can save us. Okay, what saves us is what is distinctly Christian. The Beatitudes. Okay? the corporal works of mercy which proceed from the spiritual works of mercy. What are the spiritual works of mercy? We know the corporal works because the corporal works are summarized in one text in scripture. Okay? That's why it's easy to remember. I found it too. Mm -hmm. That's of mine. Mm -hmm. I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was naked, I was whatever, in prison, 
be visited me. Yeah, but the spiritual works are scattered in the scripture. Okay, next slide. So, number one, spiritual works of mercy. What are they? We really, we really, we really need to, to know this because, especially now at an age where we have so much confusion about, you know, don't judge anybody, don't do whatever, okay, keep the peace. We need those spiritual works of mercy. Number one is admonishing a sinner. Okay. How many of us find that easy? Except you know, with your husband and wife, could be, could be easier there. But that's usually it's not good admonishing because it's not intended to build, it's intended, it's intended to press the burdens and to hurt somebody. <laughs> Somewhat sometimes. Okay? So, but admonishing is sinner. Many of us today avoid that by saying what? Nothing. God said you shouldn't judge. Who said that he said that? Okay. Admonishing a sinner. Number two, instructing the ignorant. Now, don't agitate people. Everyone's opinion is, you know, good enough. Okay. Your opinion is, is as good as mine, and so on and so forth. So, don't tell anybody about your faith. My, that's why you hear many Catholics say, "My faith is private." So if it is private, then I have no obligation to, to instruct anybody. They have their personal opinions. God loves them anyway, no matter what they do. Okay? So once you give in to that, okay, my faith is private, then you have rejected the mission of Christ to be the light of the world. You have rejected that. Okay? You have hidden the light. Number two, you have rejected being the one who is sent. Like when we go to Mass, we are sent. That's why we call it, we call it Mass. You are, you are sent out to go and proclaim the Gospel. That's why we were baptized in sharing the prophetic mission of Jesus, but more so in confirmation, okay? Affirming what we received in baptism, okay? To go and announce the witnesses. No, I'm not a witness, Jesus. My faith is private. So who are we obeying? So that's why I said, okay, oftentimes many people think that they know God, but whenever you hear someone say, my faith is private, okay, that is an ultimate lack of knowledge of Christ. Because I am rejecting the very mission Christ entrusted it to us, namely to go and be the light. Because we are afraid that in trying to be the light, there will be persecution and rejection and ridic people will ridicule us. So it's better to keep everything private. Okay? To instruct the ignorant. Mm -hmm. number, number three. Okay. Number one, we said. Cancel the doubtful. We have so many people who are tabula rasa, they don't know where to go. We need to give them counsel, advice. But in order for me to counsel someone or to, uh, to instruct them, I have to know what I'm talking about. Because I can pretend to counsel and instruct, but at the same time I'm misleading because I don't know God, I don't know what I'm talking about. Number four. Number four, to bear wrongs patiently. How many of us do that? To bear wrongs patiently. You know, you do something to me and make sure that everybody knows about it so that they know how evil a woman or a man you are. You see him? This is what he did. We go about spreading okay, in, uh, in whatever, it's called the sin of detraction or whatever, whatever it is. Okay? But we go around, you know, we can't bear, oftentimes bear any wrongs patiently. 
It doesn't mean that bear justice patiently. Okay? It says bear wrongs patiently. People who say false things about you, they tell others you did things you didn't do. Okay? To bear wrongs patiently. Okay? Another one, two. To pray for all the living and the dead. It doesn't say to pray for our living relatives and our dead relatives. Did, did you notice that? The praying for all the living and the dead. All. Oftentimes our prayer is for my family, my relatives, my country, my friends. That's selfish prayer. That's not how Jesus prays. Not that we shouldn't pray for them. Okay? But our prayer should reflect the mind of God, which is universal salvation. So those are, you know, the works we, we need. So we can't do any of those good things without God's help. God has to be at work in us for us to be able to do that. If God is not in us, we are cowards. We can't instruct the ignorant. We cannot admonish a sinner. We, we, we can't do anything. So that's why you notice today in the church, we are so much afraid because we don't know God or Jesus Christ and His mission, which is now our mission. We don't know it. Otherwise, if we knew it, we would love it. Okay? And the best way to know that is we need to dedicate ourselves to this mission. But it is us Christians who are letting all these evils in. Usually we say the other people are doing it to us, but really it's us doing it to ourselves. Because we can't stand for anything. That's why you see sometimes uh, people can, you know, it's not good. Okay? This is not good. But people can sometimes rally behind someone who at least can stand for something, whether good or evil. It doesn't matter. Okay? <laughs> like Muslims, they will tell you that we do this, we don't do this. Whether you agree with what they do or not, but at least they say, this is what we do, this is not what we do. Catholics, what do we do and what don't we do? This is like we are in a vague area. Oh, yeah. That's why sometimes people are attracted to people like Donald Trump. <laughs> he's not saying much sense, okay? but he stands by with a considerable nonsense. He stands by what he says. You call McCain a hero, he calls him a coward, and he stands by him. <laughs> okay? We, you may not like him. But at least he is standing by what he says. They tell him to apologize, I will not. Okay. But for Catholics, just to scare them, just to do this, they say, oh, no, I didn't need Okay. That's not character. That's not character. So we Catholics as church, we really lack that prophetic character. Because oftentimes we seem as if we can't stand for anything. Someone who would want to say, to address something, they just say, oh, well, you know, yeah, but we have to be understanding and, and, and we, we, have, we don't, you know, discriminate against, just to say what it is. I'm not asking you to tell me that you shouldn't discriminate or do whatever. Just tell me, is this a sin or not? They asked a bishop, what do you say about homosexuality? He couldn't give a straight answer all through the interview. Now the church has to be understanding and so we have to accept all people and families and whatever. No. Is homosexuality fine or not? He couldn't say it. A bishop, a successor of the apostles. 
So that reflects so where we are. You can't please God and the devil at the same time. It is impossible. You just can't. You can't stand for the good and the evil at the same time. Point out evil, this is evil, this is good. Now there will be consequences for saying that. That's why Jesus was crucified. That's why the apostles you know, were killed, okay? Because they said, this is what it is and this is what it is not. So to avoid the persecution, what do you do? You lead by confusion. You never really say what is wrong, what is right. You know, just steer your way. Get through it. Because at the end of it all, basically there is no longer any standard of what is good and what is evil. That's what confusion is. So that's why we have to really be courageous and know that yes, this is what we believe. I will say it. I'm not afraid of you calling me a moron or stupid or whatever. Because I know you are the one who is stupid, I'm not stupid. But because you are stupid, you can't see you are stupid. Father, one of the things that contributes to that is in the media distorting Pope Francis when he said, who am I to judge? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, so he's talking about this, the media distorting. Yes. The media has an agenda to hijack okay, the mission of the church. But that's why we should even be clear that if the media hijacks your statement, come out very quickly and say, that's not what I said. This is what the teaching is. But if we let that confusion you know, go along, we know what they are saying, but we're not addressing it, then we become part of the problem. Alright, so the Council of, that is of, not all of, <laughs> the Council of Orange. Hmm? If anyone says, Second Council of Orange, if anyone says that mercy is divinely conferred upon us, when without God's grace we believe, will, desire, strive, labor, pray, keep watch, endeavor, request, seek, knock, but does not confess that it is through the infusion and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that we believe, will, or are able to do all these things as re is required. Let him be condemned. That one is in error. We just see how the council basically explains what is necessary. Everything we do, whereby we need the grace of God to do it. Hmm? The grace to believe to will, to desire, to strive, to labor, okay, because we have to do the doing itself, what we've been talking about here, okay, to labor for salvation, okay? to pray, to keep watch, to be vigilant, okay, that we don't sink beneath the waves of sin, okay? to endeavor, to request, to seek, to knock, all those things, okay, through prayer, we need the grace of the Holy Spirit. To do that. Okay? So that's what we call actual grace. Okay? So the Council of Trent. We, we are not mentioning the years because we have already mentioned the, the years in which this council. Trent was in the year 1547. Okay? We have it in the notes before. We looked at that before. So the Council of Trent taught that the beginning of justification in adults must be attributed to God's prevenient grace, not human merit. We are talking about the grace of baptism, faith, hope, and love, faith, hope, and charity. There is nothing we can do, humanly speaking, to merit it. It is God's prevenient gift, it's pure gift, God's love, God's mercy that will receive those gifts. No one deserves it because of what they think they have done. It's God's pure gift. And the grace of baptism. That's what we call the beginning of justification. God touches the heart of the sinner, calling him or her to repentance. 
the sinner cooperates by receiving this inspiration but he or she is also free to reject it okay so without god's grace the sinner cannot by his own free will take one step toward justice meaning salvation in god's sight we can't even make one step in the direction of salvation without God's inspiration and of course our cooperation with the grace of God so Luther taught that man is justified by faith alone if Luther was crazy again, he wasn't a good theologian he didn't think like a theologian because if you know that through faith you receive three things yeah, through what we call justification. You receive the gift of faith, <coughs> hope, and love, okay? charity. So how can you say that you are saved by faith alone? Then what, what about hope and charity? So you don't need them, but that's the package you receive at baptism. So one matters, and the other two women. So, so you see his fundamental mistake by saying that we are saved by faith alone. Because if you say faith alone, then you kind of say, you're kind of saying that God gave me a package, but I only need half of it. I don't need the rest. Okay? So that's why we said that this word is not in scripture alone. It's not there. Scripture says we are faith, saved by faith, just as in other texts it says we are saved by hope, just as in other texts it says we are saved by love. But not love alone, or hope alone, or faith alone. Okay. So that was the craziness of Martin Luther. So Luther told that man is justified by faith alone, received it passively as a pure gift of God, not by any works or dispositions achieved by man. Of course, also these gifts are not received passively. Okay? They are received actively, what we call cooperation with the grace of God. Okay? So Mary, the mother of God, wasn't passive. Scripture tells us that Luke chapter 1 that Mary Elizabeth calls Mary blessed. Why? What is the basis of her blessedness? Elizabeth filled with the Holy Spirit. These are the words of the Holy Spirit. Declares Mary blessed. Why is Mary blessed? What is the basis of her blessedness? Yes. Blessed are you who believed. So we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, whatever. So blessed are you among women. She's blessed because she believed. She wasn't just there as a passive instrument and God just used her. She accepted the gifts of God through faith. That's why she is blessed. Okay? So we are not passive in this process. We actively receive. Okay. So God touches. Um, okay. So he accused, that is Luther, he accused medieval theologians of Pelagianism, okay, works righteousness, because they made room for human cooperation in the process of justification. So Luther said that the scholastics were crazy because you don't need to cooperate with the grace of God. God just gives it to you and you just accept it passively. But how do you accept it passively? You are accepting it. So it would mean that God is really like a compelling you because you have no choice. Again, that fits in with Luther's understanding that original sin totally destroyed free will so if we have no free will god is just injecting grace in us and we can't resist you see his his kind of thinking which is erroneous 
it's a heretical. Okay? So he accused the medieval theologians of Pelagianism because they made room for human cooperation in the process of justification. But indeed there is human cooperation. So in this uh, text, okay, trend, this is text, okay? in this text, trends sets forth the Catholic position showing that while justification allows for human cooperation, it has its origin and support in God's grace, without which the sinner cannot take a single step toward justification. So God offers the gift is free, but a human being can either accept or reject it. But it doesn't mean that our cooperation, our acceptance, is what is salvation. No, salvation is the gift we receive from God freely. All we need to do is to accept it. Okay, what we call faith. So if I don't have faith, I can't be saved. Because I can't cooperate with the grace of the Holy Spirit. But the cooperation itself is God's gift. Which is the gift of faith. Okay? So that's why the scripture says in church teaching, there is nothing we have that we have not received. Even my cooperation with the grace of God is not something to boast about because it is God's gift itself. So that's how we should always understand it. So theological reasoning. God calls humanity to a supernatural destiny, that is, a union with himself that surpasses all of the capacities and exigencies of nature. So our final destiny surpasses everything natural. But does it mean that because it surpasses it, therefore it seeks to destroy it? Because it is God's gift as well. So it seeks to elevate it, not destroy it. That's why, in the end, when all is in all, what we call the last judgment, if we cooperate with the grace of God, our mortal bodies, these mortal bodies, not a different body, these mortal bodies will rise from the dead. And they will be dressed in immortality. They will be likened to the risen body of Jesus Christ. Okay? But that body is the same human body it was born with, now transformed in ways beyond our understanding. That's why when Jesus appears to the apostles, he has the wounds. Because it wasn't a different body. It was that same body that was raised from the dead but now transformed in ways known to God alone that it can pass through whatever doors and walls and so on and so forth. But it is that same body. So grace doesn't destroy nature, it elevates it. But what grace offers us is way beyond the capacity of our natural powers and gifts left to themselves. So that is a very significant thing for us to, to remember. So that's why we say there is no contradiction between nature and grace if both are properly understood. So humanity's natural activity cannot bring about or merit this kind of union with God.